Um, so this is a, this talk is 10 questions I ask every developer when I interview. Um, and for those of you that might actually be looking for opportunities, I will give you the cheat sheet. So just quickly, I work at a company called TenUp. I'm actually the owner of TenUp. We're a full service web agency that focuses on making content management simple and fun. Um, we work with everything from medium-sized businesses that are invested in doing websites right, all the way up to really large customers like Time Inc. and TechCrunch um, and AARP and jQuery Foundation and Google. So we have a pretty broad range of clients, all of whom we serve doing awesome stuff on WordPress. And so, as you can imagine, running that kind of a company. Over the course of my career, that number's now out of date by a few months. Over the course of my career, I've probably interviewed at this point over 200 candidates just for developer positions. I've been responsible for hiring uh, more, than, more than 40, more than 45, not all of them at 10up, um, developers. So I've done this for a while and made a lot of mistakes early on. I was pretty terrible at it uh, at the beginning, but started to get Started to get the hang of what to look for and how to really not make assumptions based on just what their conversational skills are and how to get a little deeper into picking a developer. Along the path, I've been really lucky. If you've been around the conference, you may have had a chance to meet other people that work at 10 Up. I've had the chance to work with some really amazing people that have come out from the crowd. As I mentioned, I've also made some I've also made some mistakes uh, and tried to learn from them. I've picked the wrong thing when looking at a candidate. I've, happen to ask the next question because I just really, really wanted that to be the person that worked. Um, and so I've learned a lot. The first thing that you learn when you talk to developers, you talk to any position really, unless you're looking for communications or marketing, is that polish or slickness is not the quality that you're usually looking for in a developer. Good communication skills are important. Good coordination, good time management skills are important. But if they're coming in and really, really slick selling you, it's probably a good chance that they might not even be a fit for a high-end developer or engineering position. They might be, but just the fact that they're great at talking to you, they're great at communicating, they're great at selling themselves, doesn't mean that they're great at what they actually do. Make the service. In fact, if you're in here and you run an agency or you're involved in an agency, I'll tell you a little secret, which is that the best values to find in hiring, the best candidates to find, are probably the ones that aren't slick at all. But, so people that are not technical, as it, and can't do a technical interview, we'll go for them, they'll pick them, right, and pay a premium because they seem to know what they're talking about because they're slick. Meanwhile, all the gems that may not, may be a little awkward in an interview, may not be a great face for a company, but have amazing skills get looked over. So, when I go through interviewing, I'm basically breaking the interview process, aside from just like the what is 10 up and give me your employment history, I'm basically breaking it into three phases. Fundamentally, I'm looking for whether or not, first and foremost, the candidate actually gets the platform that we're talking about. So I'll ask a few questions. I don't think that if you're a beginner in the room that are what I consider to be sort of the basic fundamentals of understanding what it means to build on the platform that we're talking about. Just some core key ideas that tell me whether or not when you put down the resume that you have six years of expert experience in WordPress, if you don't understand these basic concepts, it's a pretty big flag early on that it's probably not a fit. The next thing I'm looking for is a sense of how much that person, that candidate, actually knows about the platform in depth. So you've got the basics, you understand sort of what a hook is, and some other things we'll talk about. But how good are you? How good are you really? And we'll talk about this more, but there's there's really two reasons for this. The first reason for this, of course, is I want to know, like, do you start if the spectrum of people that we can hire and tied to different price ranges we can afford goes from here to here. I want to know whether you're down here, whether you're in the middle, whether you're at the top of that spectrum, each of those in my mind have price points associated with them. The other thing that I'm trying to do, those actually doing interviewing in the room, is I'm letting, a develop, I'm letting some developers that show up, have been building on WordPress for a year, might think they're real hot shots, that know everything that there is, and come to impress. It's a little bit of reality check for some of those on how much they really know. I'm going to ask some really hard questions, some of which you'll see in here, not all of which, which I think it's really good for that candidate, both for me in a hiring position and for the candidate in terms of knowing their value, to be taken aback and probably not have an answer to some of those questions. The right kind of candidates, sticking with number two, the right kind of candidates will also like being at a place where they can learn and be able to answer new questions. The third thing I'm looking for is not tech skills, not tech chops. The third thing I'm looking for is the candidate's ability to think critically. We all know that 
WordPress and technology and web development are changing all the time, right? It's always evolving. It's always changing. WordPress, five years from now, is probably going to look different in a lot of ways, right? A lot more front end, a lot more script heavy, right, with JavaScript than it does now. So it's really important when you're looking at a candidate not just to judge their ability to have taken be what we call, I guess, book smart, right? To sort of know all the syntax and all the language, but their ability to think critically and to solve the problems and think about the problems that they're working with at a level that's deeper than just writing code. There's a few rules that I have, um, some of which I'll share with the candidate, tell the candidate, some of which I sort of keep to myself when I'm going through an interviewing process. First of all, there's, which might be obvious, there's not always one right answer, especially when you're talking about development, when you're talking about solutions to problems. I'm not, I don't have written down on a cheat sheet in front of me that this is the one acceptable answer I need to hear from you. I'm looking for different solutions. I'm open to different approaches to solving some of these problems. That said, there are some answers that are better and some that are worse. We'll look at examples of those, some that are, you know, okay answers or something that you have some insight, and some answers that show me like you really nail, you really know exactly what I'm talking about. There are also some really wrong answers. There's some answers that are just like completely in the wrong territory and show total lack of understanding of the core idea. And we'll look at we'll look at examples of that. The most important rule is is the last one, which is Acknowledging that you don't know something, that you don't understand something, is a lot better than making some crap up um, for me on the spot and winging it. Um, I call this the SAT rule of my interviewing. At least I think the SAT still have that rule where it's better to leave a question unanswered in terms of your point than it is to answer it and answer it wrong. Um, it's fine, especially for some of the questions that I'll get into on more advanced development, say I've never worked with that or never had the chance to explore. That, that's fine, that helps me assess where you are on the spectrum. If you're just going to make something up, you're just going to tell me something that you clearly just tried to wing, um, that's a red flag for me because it tells me that you don't know how to acknowledge your limitations, which is really important when you work with somebody. And that, you know, and it raises an honesty question, right? It makes me wonder if you worked here and I asked you in three weeks after you're here to build something and you might need the realities, you might need help, which is fine, or some mentoring to learn how to do that, that you're going to tell me, oh yeah, no problem, I know how to do that. Um, and then we're going to find out after you've turned and gotten nowhere for a week that you really didn't know how to do that. So let's start with three examples of the first category of question, which are sort of basic developer. I consider basic WordPress developer topics, which is how well a candidate actually knows this platform called WordPress. So I think if you're going to be an engineer, a developer in WordPress, the most fundamental idea you better walk in and understand is what a hook is, what the concept of a hook is. And more than what a concept of a hook is, tell me about how that concept is applied and used inside of WordPress. This is not what a book is, um, although one of those select marketing type candidates positioning themselves as an engineer told me this is what a book was. Um, it is not a killer feature that gets them hooked into the software. The first part of this answer seems a little promising, right? It's a way to extend WordPress, that's right. Um, what's not right that I've heard from a bunch of candidates that call themselves expert WordPress developers are that the two types of hooks are plugins and themes. Plugins and themes are objects, are packages that may contain any number of books that extend WordPress, and they themselves are not, are not books. So putting aside WordPress, because hooks are a concept that exists in most software, most customizable, extendable software, the formal definition is that a hook is a technique used to alter or augment the behavior of software. It's applied in WordPress basically in two different ways. WordPress has a concept called action hooks, and WordPress has a concept called filter hooks. Action hooks are hooks that WordPress launches at specific intervals during execution. So an action hook, there's code inside WordPress that basically says when you get to this place, give people a chance to hook in, to jump in here, and run some of their own code. The syntax of that, which you can easily find on the WordPress codex, uh, if you want to hook into an action hook is add action. It takes the name of that hook, the name of the place in WordPress, that spot in WordPress you want to jump into. It takes the name of a function you want to run when it gets to that space. And then it takes some optional arguments relating to what the priority um, is for it and the, um, and the number of arguments you want to pass it up. I'm not going to get too technical for this talk into what, into examples and how to use, how to use hooks, but that's the fundamental syntax and there's tons of documentation or on the codex. A great example of an action hook that people use all the time are the WP head and the WP footer.
action hooks. If everybody's built a theme but not really done any hooking, you know you do have those little functions called WP head and WP footer. All of those contain is a hook that lets developers say, when you get here, when you get to this place in the header, when you get to this place in the footer, let me jump in and spit out some scripts on the page or, you know, or drop in something in the footer. The other types of hook in WordPress are filter hooks. These are functions that WordPress passes data through at certain points in execution just before taking some action on it. So this is WordPress just did something, it just got some block of data, and now it wants to give you a chance to manipulate that data before, it ha before it's displayed on the screen or saved to the database. <laughs> just like add action is a, is a function in WordPress that lets you use those hooks called add filter. Again, takes the name of the filter that you want to hook into, takes the name of a function that you want to call back to to run, and then again takes the priority, so compared to all the other filters looking into this, when do you want this to run, and again takes accepted <laughs> arguments, and again I'm not going to get into all of how to use hooks in depth, you can find all that on the codex with great documentation. A great example of a filter hook that we see used all the time is something like the content, right, which lets you, before WordPress displays the content of a post or a page or a, or a post type on the screen, gives you a chance to come in and manipulate what that looks like. Um, and alter it before it's displayed on the screen. So, then after we sort of talk about the most basic concept of extending WordPress, then I want to know if you understand the very basics of WordPress information architecture, right? The very basics of how WordPress organizes its content, its data, and the relationships between them. So, one key component of understanding information architecture, which again goes way beyond WordPress um, and its application, is a taxonomy. Taxonomies are not taxidermy. Um, it is not a way to preserve or comment out code. I've heard this one uh, a few times, that it's types of content in WordPress. It's the posts, it's the pages, it's media, it's menus. Um, those are also not taxonomies in WordPress. Those are what WordPress called post types, what we may generically call for other platforms, content types or object types. In WordPress, it's another key part of its information architecture, but it's not what a taxonomy is. The most simple definition of a taxonomy is it's a way to group things together. By default, for all themes, WordPress has two post taxonomies that are exposed to publishers. If you write content or publish with WordPress, you probably know categories and tags. Those are both taxonomies, classifications, ways to group things together, to group content together. There are a few lesser known taxonomies that ship with WordPress, not counting the ones you can make on your own in a theme or a plugin. Can anybody, so I, there's three in particular that I have in mind. Can anybody tell me about some other default taxonomies that are built into WordPress? Nav item, so close. The nav item are usually post types, but you're close. Anybody else think of any other classifications, grouping of items in WordPress? Yep. So the links themselves are taxonomies. Right. So there's link categories, which you're asked about. Yep. Link categories is one of them. And the menus themselves, which is what you're close to, the menus themselves are groupings of posts and pages and other terms. Anybody know what the third one is? It's probably the one that's most slapping you in the face that you're going to slap your forehead. Users? No. <laughs> post status. What? Post status. Published versus. That's actually not a taxonomy in WordPress. It's a, like a hard coded. It's kind of a taxonomy. Kind of a taxonomy, yeah. Could be a taxonomy. Probably, probably shouldn't be a taxonomy. So, ones you mentioned link categories, which is right. So you mentioned navigation menus, which is right on. The last one that everybody's going to slap their forehead is post formats, um, which is activated in most of the newer themes with WordPress. Post formats was introduced into core a few versions back. So if you have one of the newer themes, like 2013, where you can choose like it's a video format post or an image format post, those formats are also a taxonomy. So my next question gets at, in my mind, fundamentally gets at understand what open source software, what open source development is about and working on open platforms. So let's say, which is, this is a real function inside of WordPress, um, one that I think is a little bit lesser known, but is a useful helper function. So let's say you're a developer, you've come across this brand new function, we'll use WP list filter as an example. You see it for the first time, what do you do next? How do you, how do you figure out what this does? Anybody wanna? Go ahead. 
code X is one answer that we'll, we'll look at. You're the all star in the room. So, first answer that I get, which I know all of you were thinking, um, is, is Google, right? So, the cheap, quick answer is I'll type in that function name in Google and see what comes up. And yeah, sure, that's a valid answer. I probably do too. It was a quick response. But I'm usually going to challenge that, that candidate and say, okay, well, suppose you don't find anything clear, you find conflicting information on Google, you don't get the answer you want. Go deeper with me. The next most obvious place people jump is the codex, which again, it's not a wrong answer. If there is documentation for that function on the codex, it's usually, it can be pretty good, it can be pretty detailed with examples, but oftentimes a lot of these more ancillary functions don't have anything except a stub on the codex saying, yeah, there's this function um, that has some arguments. So you got it exactly right. The answer that I'm really looking for, if I challenge them and say, okay, well, pretend the codex doesn't give you any useful information, where do you go next? It's open source, right? the value and the power of open source that you can go into the code and see exactly what that function is, what it's built, look for hooks inside of the function. Um, P you know, WordPress is pretty diligent about using what's called the PHP doc standard and really documenting all the functions and classes and objects in it. It's not as scary as you think. Go look for it in the source code, figure out what it does. It's also a great way to learn. Every single great developer I know, and I will, I'll say this without exception, every single great WordPress developer I know is, not, is the first place that they will go in their application is to go looking for and see exactly what it does. You'll learn a lot from seeing how Core does it and approaches problems and reading other people's code. And it'll force you to really understand fundamentally what that function does, not just the description. So the next, the next section of questions is the, so you think you're good at this section as I call it, which is okay. You pass this first part of the interview, we can keep talking here. You understand some of the basics of what it means to be a developer. Now let's get a little bit deeper. Let's see how far you can take this. And again, two reasons for it. One, I need to know how good you are on day one, how much teaching you need. I also want you to know how good you really are. So one really important concept, probably the easiest, I consider the most fundamental of the advanced questions, is to explain the concepts of sanitizing and validating data, explain them broadly, and then talk to me about how these are applied and how these these might be used in WordPress. So this is an answer I've gotten a few times. That's again, not the right answer. It's not about just looking at the database and check, looking for corrupted tables and checking database integrity. That's not the idea. This is not a bad layman's explanation of what it's about, testing data to make sure that it's what you expected. But I'm looking for something a little more sophisticated. So then, the real definition, fundamental idea of sanitizing and validating data is that untrusted data comes from many sources. It comes from third party sites, comes from your database, comes from your publishers typing in content that might be crazy in all kinds of places. It needs to be validated both on input and output. We need to look at the data before it's saved. We need to make sure that the data is safe before you spit it out on the screen. So WordPress, and this is what I'm really looking for to show me, show me what you know. When I'm talking to a candidate, WordPress includes a whole bunch of helper functions to help ensure that output and input is safe. It has a whole bunch of helpers inside of WordPress, inside of its framework, to help you make sure it is in a good state. Dealing with HTML fragments, which are just blocks of HTML, so you may have put something like the editor. Dealing with text nodes, which is like a free-form text field, right, that you may have added to a post screen. Um, dealing with attributes, that might be like a, you know, an attribute, a tag, a title, attribute. Um, so some examples of sanitation uh, and validation helpers in WordPress. Some of you may know WP, was called WP Kisses. This is a function that lets you pass into it what came maybe from the database, what came back from that user. That's what the string is, the first, uh, first parameter. The second parameter is an array, is an array of tags and attributes that you will allow them, that you will allow them to use in that HTML. Um, WordPress has some default globals you can use for things that are like accepted in the regular HTML editor. Um, and then allow protocols for things like HTTP, HTTPS, and, uh, and links. So this will take a block of HTML and help you clean it up. So whether you want to use WordPress as a default cleaners, that'll strip out script tags, strip out other dangerous tags, or whether you want to you know, roll your own or you can say, I want this box to only be allowed to have bold tags and italic tags and bold tags and no other content. Helps you make sure HTML content is safe. WordPress is a bunch of functions to help text nodes and attributes. There's a, one is, an example is escape HTML which will make sure that um, tags uh, are safe before displaying it in something like a text input box. 
is escape URL, which makes sure, let's say you're saving a, let's make, say somebody you have an input box on your post type screen, or somebody you want somebody to type in a web address that they want to link to, it'll make sure that that URL is actually in a correct and valid format. Even lets you select what protocols you allow, HTTP only, maybe HTTP, HTTPS, FTP. There are helper functions in WordPress. There's a WPDB class. It helps you make sure that if you need to go directly to the database to do interaction, that your data is in a clean and safe state. There are even file helpers if you want looking at saving something to the file system or saving something to the content folder to make sure all that data is clean. So this is what uh, this is my question that in giving this talk and putting this talk online has made my interviews harder because I'm trying to come up with one as good as this <laughs> question that gets to their ability to understand how to solve a problem in WordPress. So this doesn't seem like that wild of a question that a that somebody that writes a blog or runs a website might come up with. Right, let's say your client says, hey, I'm writing all these blog posts. I want all of them to be in my category in case they're interested in a very specific vertical of my site. I may want to link directly to this post. For some people, I don't want all of the stuff showing up on my home page in the stream. How can you let me write some posts and then choose whether or not I want to show it in my main home feed of articles? How would you achieve that? So one of the, one of the first interesting observations I make when I ask this question is where, where the candidate goes first. Do they start talking about the technical, which we'll get to in a minute, of how they actually exclude it on the front end? Do they start thinking about what the, what the read publisher's experience is and start thinking about, well, where do I give them the choice to exclude it? So I'm ultimately looking for an answer that talks to both, but it's also very fascinating observationally, depending on what kind of engineer you're looking at, to think about where they go first with this question. They start thinking about the user experience, they start thinking about the technical internals and optimization. So starting with that, that user approach, the publisher approach, a very common answer is that they would add a new category, right, to the category list called exclude from home or something, and they would let the they would let the author check that if they wanted to exclude it from the home page. This is an okay answer, it's not a bad answer, but it's also not a very good answer. If you export WordPress, right, the ID of that category might change, depending on how you're filtering it out later. Um, it's pretty easy for publishers to accidentally delete a category if they go to the category list and you'll have to recreate it, you'll probably again want to reference it by ID, which has now changed inside those lists. And I also just don't like, just like that a lot of different categories, it seems awkward to me to make them scroll through a list of things that aren't really, then do you want a slash exclude from home category that people can go to? So it's not a bad answer, but it's not really what I'm looking for. Much closer to the answer I'm looking for would be to create a new meta box, create a new field box, a new field on the screen for uh, creating posts with an exclude from home page, check box in it that lets you know, lets the publisher just check that option somewhere on that screen if they want to exclude it. A very rare answer that tells me somebody really is paying attention to how to do user experience in WordPress and publishing experience is this answer. This is like super bonus points. We can end the interview. Let's talk about a job. Um, if you know of the existence of this hook inside WordPress, going back to action hooks, there's a hook inside WordPress called post submit box miss actions. This hook runs right under, in, that, in the publish box, you have the publish button right under like the the date you want to schedule it to post, the status of the post is a hook that lets you insert other fields in that box, right there. So you can insert that same checkbox we talked about in the last slides, but actually put it right in the publish box above the, above the publish button, the checkbox. So that's that's the publisher experience side. The next side that I really want to get to, and it's interesting that some people only answer the publishing experience and never talk about how to actually technically achieve it, but then there's the technical. Approach. This is a, maybe we need to just end this interview um, answer, because it tells me you not only really don't understand WordPress, but you're not thinking, you don't, you're not thinking critically about the problem. Um, a very, very wrong answer to this question is in your loop, right, in the place in the WordPress code where you loop through each of your posts and display on the page, put a little if around it saying if it's in that, if it's in that uh, meta field that says exclude from homepage, or if it's in the don't show on homepage category, don't show it. In which case, I'll ask, okay, well, let, let's say you have 10 posts per page, right? And let's say the last 10 posts that they wrote, they didn't want to show on the home page. Tell me what their home page looks like. It's an empty home page, right? Or even, in, even more realistically, let's say three of the last 10. So now they have seven on their first page, and then they have maybe four on the next page, maybe 10 on the next page. So just doing a check right inside the loop is definitely, definitely not the right way to solve this problem. This is also a wrong answer, although a less horribly wrong answer um, than the last one. 
they would, in their home.php template, which is the lowest level template for rendering that home page, they would do a new WP query or query posts right before they do the loop um, with a parameter saying exclude, you know, again, that meta field or, you know, don't include things that have that meta field or exclude from home page or don't have that category. This is wrong for a few reasons that are a little bit more sophisticated. This is not a the interviews over, but this is this really reveals to me how, how deeply you understand WordPress. The problems with this, because I'm sure some of you are thinking this that are developers, the problems with this, number one, is that it makes it more comp that query is more complicated than you think. I can't tell you the number of times I've seen people do this and then forget to deal with the previous posts link. Right? Forget to, and then every time that home.php template loads, it just keeps reloading those same first 10 posts. They didn't deal with pagination or other problems that might come up. The other from an efficiency and like high-end engineering standpoint, you're also running the query twice. WordPress, before that template loads, before it even finds and says we need to use home.php, runs a query to go get all of your own home page posts and then says let's use home.php to render this. So you let it do the original query to get all the posts, including the ones you wanted to exclude, and then you let it, and then you later on went and did another query, a second query, wasting the first one to, to show items again. The real answer to this, although using the, the lesser approach, user approach with categories, the real answer to this is there is a, a hope that I think any great, great engineer knows about in WordPress and uses in WordPress called pre-get posts. This is an action hook that hooks into the post query, checks, and then you can, before it actually does anything with it. So before any query, before WordPress actually executes any WP query requests, any query post request, WordPress, you get a chance to jump in there and say, hey, let me look at that. Let me look at that WP query request before you go to the database and run. So I can hook into, I can use pre get post to hook into WP query, see if in fact we're doing the query for the home page, see if it's that main query, and if it is, change some properties of the query right before it runs. It's to say, don't show posts with that meta field set, don't show posts with that category set. That's the re that's the ideal answer to this question. And if you're trying to, if you're a mid level developer, you're trying to be a great developer, pre get posts, by the way, is a hook you should really know about. So this is a fun question that also tells me about other chops with WordPress and how much they've thought about it. I want to know what their favorite function in WordPress. What's the coolest thing inside WordPress as a developer? They love using the API. They get excited. They get to play with one that's impressed them. Tell me about tell me about code you like that lives in WordPress. One popular answer, or Mason, who was here and speaking later, this is his answer to this question. It's a neat function in WordPress called media side load image that actually so the parameters are um, the files. So it can be a URL on a remote site where that image is, the post ID that you want to attach it to, and if you would like, the description or the title of that, of that image. It will actually go, this function actually goes to that remote site where that image is, pulls it down inside WordPress into your media gallery, and attaches that image, to, attaches that description to it, and attaches it to the post that you request. It's a pretty neat helper function, especially if you're writing like importers. This is one of my favorites, because it's just so, it makes something that's actually really tedious to write your own code for, really, really simple. It's a function called human time difference that takes the first time and the second time and then spits out, spits out a human readable version of this. So instead of, if you want to show a post and you want to say this post was published five days ago as opposed to this, as opposed to this post was published on October 21st, right, or October 20th, that function lets you very easily get a human readable version of the difference between those two times. Published an hour ago, published five days ago. This is another cool little function, not just because it has a cool sounding name in WordPress. WP list block takes a list, so it takes an array or an array of objects, lets you specify, or in this case, just an array, lets you specify um, in that array of objects which field, which, which, uh, which value inside of each of those objects you want to pull out and give you back an array with just those. So the practical example for developers is let's say you have an array of post objects, right? So you didn't get both, you get back an array of all the different posts each of which have a title field, for example. Let's say you just want to get all the titles. With WP list block, if you pass that array of posts, you can say, I want to get just the title field, and I'll give you back a new array with just all the titles inside of it. Doing it wrong is another geeky WordPress favorite function. If you have WP debug mode on or debug logging, um, it'll let you throw an error on the screen. So if somebody is, let's say, in your, in your plugin or your API that you're writing, you think a developer is very likely to make a common mistake, misunderstand something about how it works, and you want to alert them that they're not doing it the right way and send them some sort of useful message. Doing it wrong lets you tell that, lets you to specify what the function is. 
that was problematic on a message that you want to show um, that developer. So question seven, now we get like, to layered questions. We're going to just sort of whiz through these ones. It's going to quickly show off some more complex APIs in WordPress. Let's say, you need to re let's say you can get a pretty common requirement in the day of like interacting between different websites and getting data and JSON feeds, right? Let's say you need to retrieve some data from a remote source once a day. So let's say there's some feed that you have from some other publisher that sends you, sends you once a day a list of their upcoming events that you need to show on your site. And you need to go pull that data down um, and display it, reformat it, and display it the way you want on your website. Tell me how you go about solving that problem and some of the APIs you would use inside WordPress to solve that problem. One second. So, the first thing I want to hear you talk about, I want to hear a developer talk about that really knows his or her stuff, is the WP cron, so called WP cron function. These are functions inside WordPress, and I let people know this is a whole bunch of functions right inside WordPress that handle event scheduling for you, that handle timing events. One is called WP schedule event. That lets you say you want to run something by default either daily, twice a day, every hour you want this function to run. And WordPress will handle all the internals for you. I won't walk through all the code, but that's a very simple example um, some code that would walk you through scheduling an event. Um, you basically define a hook that you want. You then have a, you have a callback function where you can check to make sure that the event is not already scheduled. If it's not, you can schedule it and then it will run, will run the associated, the next associated hook. Um, so you can do things like say, once a day, not every time somebody loads this page, right? Not every time they click the go get the feed button. At some, at certain number of intervals, go get some data. The next thing I'm looking for, I'm a good developer, is understanding the remote APIs, the WP HTTP APIs inside WordPress. These are functions that let developers in a way that makes you have to worry far less about how the server is configured, how WordPress is, how um, the underlying infrastructure is configured, and go and get data from remote sites. So there are functions in WordPress like WP Remote Post that take whether a whole bunch of lines of curl or other methods of getting remote data that you might not be able to count on the server, and then goes and handles the request from you. The only thing that's actually required in WP Remote Post is just the URL. It'll go fetch that URL, pull back the contents in a string for you from that URL. You can, just like with curl or other systems, you can specify a whole bunch of other properties to control how that data is fetched. And WordPress will actually, for some of the already developed in the room, WordPress will actually go through and say, okay, is, is curl available? No. Is file get open available? It'll actually work for you and see what what the best way, given that server, that infrastructure, is to get that data. And by the way, it also handles a lot of caching and a lot of, intelli and a lot of other backend intelligent um, items that make sure this performs well, make sure that you're not, every time, time somebody hits the page, going and doing the full request. An extra credit part of this answer would be to understand caching functions in WordPress. WordPress has an API called the Transient API, which makes caching pretty easy. Caching, for caching fragments or caching small objects in WordPress. So after you've gone, so after you've used the scheduler to say run this function twice a day, and then you've used the remote API, right, to go and get that data, you're going to do a whole bunch of crunching and parsing and twisting that data around to display the way you want it. Don't make WordPress do that every single time the page renders. Do all that formatting, save it in the cached item, save it in the transient, and that way when WordPress goes and reloads that page and shows it over and over again, all it has to do is go get it from if you have an object cache, go get it from memory. If you don't, go get it from the database. Just one row in the database and show it on the screen. So these are the kinds of questions of a more bit that will let me know how advanced a developer really is, how sophisticated they are, how deep they can go into WordPress. The last groupings of questions are the are the thinking questions, right? So you show me you understand the basics of WordPress, all right, you get what a hook is, you understand information architecture, you've shown me somewhere along the spectrum of those questions, you have at least have some sense of where you fall in WordPress expertise, but are you gonna be there when we get to hard problems that you haven't encountered yet, right? Are you gonna be evolving with the company, right, as, as new challenges come out on the web? So a very simple question to ask is just, what's interesting? Tell me about inside the space of content management and making websites. What are some interesting trends? What are you interested in? I'll sometimes ask people, like, if I, if I just hired you and gave you three months and did not tell you what to do other than go study something and come back an expert in some new field, what would you do with those three months? Where would you take, where would you take those sponsored three months? 
one very common answer that's great is studying what it means, the evolution of responsive design in mobile. We talk a lot about ideas like now progressive enhancement and mobile first, not actually building a whole desktop site and then collapsing it down, but starting with mobile and going up, right? I think that's a really fascinating field. Um, but that I mean, we only started to tap what this means for things like advertising, what it means for actually optimized images, you know, in different breakpoints. I think this is a great place to go. I think high DPI, or what Apple calls Retina technology, um, is another interesting challenge. We still have we still have problems to figure out in this space having to do with things like when you upload an image, you know, how to automatically format it in different resolutions and know which one to serve to the user right on the front end. Again, some of those same performance challenges in the last slide. Do I have to serve a double-sized image if I'm uploading something in WordPress and showing it? Do I have to serve a double-sized image to everyone? Um, Meaningful social media integration. Um, social media is sort of a cheap answer, but I think people that have gone deeper with this answer talk about things like, okay, well, we, everybody puts a sharing button right on their posts. That's kind of shallow. What does it mean to go to the next level with social media integration? What does it mean to do things with e-commerce and knowing what your friends right, are purchasing, um, what their transactions are? What does it mean to, to really explore beyond just the sharing button on a website? What social media integration can mean? This goes back to responsive design, but I think there's a lot of interesting thinking to do beyond just responsive design about what an explosion uh, in devices means. Everything's from constant rumors and early, early examples of watches, to television screens, to phones, to tiny computers, to, very, to huge 27-inch displays um, on your desktop. Getting deeper into what this means and what, I mean, what does it mean when TVs, people actually start browsing more on their TVs. I mean, if, are we going to have to, I mean, those of you that are around cross-browser testing, IE7 and, and Firefox, right? Like, imagine what this means when now you have to worry about 100 different kinds of, like, phones, right? Even four different kinds of phone makers, and it's five different kinds of TVs, right? All these different devices. I think typography is still an interesting subject. That font face has been pretty well adapted for a while now, but I think it's, my personal feeling about uh, typography, although it's getting better, is that a lot of people use it like they used animated GIFs when they came out. Ooh, we can do typography. So let me pick some cool font because it's different and it's novel. Um, it'll make my site look different without any deeper thinking about how it really plays with your content, whether it's actually an improvement. So this is my favorite uh, can you think question, which is you probably came into this interview thinking they're a WordPress company, and I'm like, how much I love WordPress and how awesome it is, and it's the best thing ever, and I can't wait to start using it. I want you to criticize WordPress for me. I want to tell you to tell me what you don't like about this platform, what aggravates you as a developer using WordPress. There are plenty of good answers to this question. Um, the taxonomy term architecture, which we say is going to get better, if you really pay close attention, is broken. There's no term meta if you're a developer. Many of you may have encountered that. There are some strange artifacts, like a tag and a category that have the same name. If you change one, you will change the other. Um, there are some weird quirks in our taxonomy architecture that need to be fixed. Um, there aren't really good ways besides clunky meta meta relationships to create direct one-to-one -one object relationships right inside WordPress. You can kind of think it with meta and saying it's related, but there's no one-to-one. -one. This post is directly related to this post and it's and it's a core tag or information architecture. Again, looking at the way different people look at the world and look at experiences, those publishing experiences, plenty to critique here. Um, how many people have done the grab the widget, pull it over, try to not make your screen scroll too fast while you get to the right box, right? Or with menus. There's plenty to criticize around WordPress's, you know, WordPress's uh, publishing experience. It's managing and curating experience to make better. There are also examples where WordPress doesn't handle conflicts well, right? It doesn't inherently set up to deal with bad developers making non namespace functions colliding with each other. There's even some silly thing, like if I define my menu position as the same, and my custom post type as the same menu position as somebody else defines their menu position in their plugin, whoever goes last wins, and mine disappears. So plenty of things to criticize about WordPress, and I want to know, if you could work on WordPress, we work on WordPress a lot, what would you work on, what would you improve? One more question. I think this is a, this is a little bit of a softball to end with, right? But try to understand why somebody why is somebody choosing WordPress, right? Why do they want to work with this platform? Somebody that really does want to work with the platform will have an answer to this question. This is a perfectly fine answer that I get a lot. It's increasingly becoming the dominant CMS on the web, and they want their skill to reflect what the what's popular. Perfectly fine, great answer. 
I get this one a lot, again, people with the publishing experience, that it's the one platform where customers don't call them back every single month and need the third retraining of that month because they can't figure it out. They like the fact that it makes for people that leave them alone right after they publish their website. I've gotten this answer from some developers, especially some very high-end developers. Um, it's a philosophical belief in WordPress, believing in open source and GPL and an open platform that you can own and you can control, wanting to work in open source and give back to a project where you own your content, you control your content, is a really great, uh, a really great reason. And then we'll mushily answer on the last reason, and I get this one probably more than any other answer, which is they found WordPress, they discovered WordPress, and they wanted to stick around with WordPress because they love events like WordCamp. They went to a WordCamp, they went to a meetup, they encountered some people online, they love this community, and they want to get more involved in this community. So those are the 10 questions. I'm going to quickly plug, if you want my slide deck, you can go to my website. Um, I'll put it on Twitter after this. At Jake and Gold, it's just jakegoldman.me slash slide slash 10 questions. The slideshow is built completely in WordPress. Um, it is being played from WordPress using a plugin called SEO Slides that we, um, that we have a partial ownership of. You can check out seoslides.com, and I think it's pretty awesome. It's worked pretty well. That's the problem.